the autumn of 1958, spectators at the annual meeting of the Society of British Aircraft Constructors at Farnborough witnessed a jet age still in its nascent state. The fastest British aircraft of the day and the latest innovations in aviation technology could be examined both on the ground and overhead. Proven military aircraft like the Hawker Hunter, prototypes like the short SC-1 and the Ferry Rotodyne flew alongside the newest passenger aircraft, high-speed jets and the latest in helicopter technology. Ferry Aviation displayed two rotary-winged aircraft that year at Farnborough. Each of these, they hoped, would bring them a share of the helicopter market. The aircraft seen here is their ultralight, unique among aircraft of its day. A stainless steel underfin mounted in the efflux of its engine provided yaw control. The turbine engine did not drive its rotor through a gearbox. Instead, air ducted from the engine was combined with kerosene and burned at the end of each rotor blade. Ferry called this tip jet power, and it produced the thrust that powered the rotor. That year at Farnborough, Ferry introduced a vertical takeoff and landing airliner with a rotor powered in a similar fashion. It was named the Rotodyne. The Rotodyne was a prototype aircraft that was bold in concept and execution. Its design took several ideas from the very beginnings of rotary winged flight and used them to build an aircraft that took off and landed like a helicopter but flew as a gyrocopter, utilizing the rotor to provide lift in auto rotation. To fully appreciate a project like the Rotodyne, one must first consider the history of rotary winged aircraft the world over and their effect in Great Britain. Things really began to happen in the early 20s, between 1925-26, around that sort of time. And Brennan produced this very large uh, helicopter which was driven by propellers on the tips of the blades. And that was remarkably successful in, in achieving well, for the time, were, were quite significant flights. Now, they were only a few minutes at a time, and they were only in the hover. And it was very difficult to control any, with any um, conviction. But um, it was getting there, and clearly progress would have been made. However, just around that time, Juan de la Sierra brought his Hortogiaro to Britain and demonstrated it to the ministry at Farnborough. They were highly impressed with this and decided this was perhaps the way to go. And it's rather sad that Brennan's work really rather got shelved after that. And Brennan is quoted as saying that, that the helicopter sh shall and should exist is a foregone conclusion. And I think it is irresponsible to discontinue any work on it. And Brennan's aircraft was designed to history. Sierra became the flavor of the month. Now, of course, Sierra himself was a Spaniard, but he brought his whole project to Britain, financed to a large extent by the Weir Company, the significant thing about Sierra's aircraft are that he never ever designed a helicopter. and never intended to design a helicopter. All he intended to design was an aircraft that was proof from the stall. Sierra's autogyro was the first successful rotary-winged aircraft, or gyrocopter. A gyrocopter does not have a powered rotor. Instead, the rotor is used to provide lift as it rotates from the forward speed of the aircraft. Although it could not take off vertically or hover, it could execute an impressively short takeoff and landing. Like modern day helicopters, a certain degree of roll control could be maintained by varying the angle of the rotor head. An Austrian named Raoul Hafner brought his R2 helicopter to England in 1932. Hafner built the R2 with Bruno Nagler and they achieved limited success with this design. In England, Hafner also designed and built gyrocopters. During World War II, he developed a lightweight auto-rotating system for lowering airborne forces and their jeeps to the ground. These were called the roto-chute and the roto-buggy. The R2 helicopter had a powered three-blade rotor with collective and cyclic pitch control. The torque of this powered rotor was counteracted by two vertical fins placed in the rotor downwash. 
a rotor driven with an engine produces torque at the drive shaft. In a helicopter, this causes the airframe to tend towards rotating in the opposite direction to which the rotor is spinning. The first helicopter to truly overcome the action of torque on an airframe was Germany's Focke-Wulf FW61. It flew for the first time with Luftwaffe test pilot Hanna Reitsch at the controls in June of 1936. The FW61 was a twin rotor helicopter. It is credited with being the first successful powered rotary winged aircraft. The two rotors solved the problem of torque by counter rotating. Effectively, each rotor produced equal amounts of torque in a direction opposite the other. This made the FW61 extremely controllable. So controllable, in fact, that Hannah Reich flew a series of demonstration flights inside a stadium called the Deutschlandhalle. After World War II ended, many German engineers and development ideas went to other countries. The helicopter industry owes a great deal to the German effort. It's not fair to say anyone cribbed anything or, or, or cheated in any way, but all progress is made by other people's progress. You don't try and reinvent the wheel every time. If someone's solved a technical problem, needless to say, everybody else starts to adapt it once the patents start to run out, and of course the patents run out with the invasion. Helicopter manufacturers were also influenced by the pre-war designs of a Russian aeronautical engineer. Igor Sikorsky had fled to America during the Bolshevik Revolution. Before the Second World War, his VS-300 generated interest among military planners in America and Great Britain. The VS-300 was the first helicopter to utilize the main and tail rotor configuration. During World War II, the Sikorsky R-4 was developed from the VS-300. This helicopter underwent trials for the United States Army and Navy, as well as Britain's Royal Navy. After the Second World War, several companies in Great Britain began producing rotary winged aircraft. Westland Aircraft began building the S-51 under license from Sikorsky. The Sierra Autogyro Company began work on their air horse. Raoul Hafner joined the Bristol Airplane Company and designed the Bristol Type 173. And Ferry Aviation began work on a project that would lead to the innovative aircraft known as the Rotodyne. During the final months of World War II, aircraft manufacturers saw the need to replace military orders with aircraft for the civil market. This was the case with Ferry Aviation. Ferry Aviation was founded in 1915 and was a primary producer of carrier-based aircraft for the Royal Navy. With the helicopter business still in its infancy, Ferry decided to test the waters of the relatively new helicopter market. The company was obviously interested in getting into the helicopter or certainly understanding the helicopter business because just as an aside, Westland Aircraft, as it was then, in fact started to build helicopters designed by Sikorsky under license around about 1946-47. So there was a general desire in the aircraft business for the aircraft companies to be involved with helicopter design and manufacture. A design team was formed at Ferry under Dr. J. Bennett, who had worked previously with both the Sierva and Weir companies. Members of the design team also came to Ferry from Dobelhof in Germany, where the first tipjet drive helicopter had been built in 1944. The first helicopter effort from Ferry took shape as the Gyrodyne. 
its design replaced the now familiar tail rotor with a forward thrusting propeller mounted on the starboard wing. This propeller also provided yaw control and the stub wings served to offload the rotor during forward flight. The uh, original Gyrodyne was Fairy Aviation Company's first effort to produce a helicopter as a private venture vehicle. I believe that they imported some of the engineers from Weir, which in fact, the Weir Company, which took over a lot of the um, activities of the old Sierva Company. First flown in December of 1947, the Gyrodyne performed well through its early flight trials. In June of the following year, it gained a world speed record by flying at almost 108 knots over a short course. Work was started on fabricating a second gyrodyne, and the first prototype began flight trials towards setting a speed record over a 100 kilometer closed circuit course. However, in the spring of 1949, the gyrodyne program came to an unfortunate end. They ran into a major problem with the gyrodyne, which ended in a catastrophic crash, which killed the crew. And that really put the end of the gyrodyne. But the second aircraft was still available. They were then looking at um, Tipjet Drive. And they said, OK, let's adapt this aircraft as a Tipjet Drive vehicle. An investigation into the crash I think showed that the same standard of engineering that the company applied to its other vehicles had not necessarily been introduced into the, um, into the gyrodyne. So the company decided that it would set up a helicopter design team which had the same disciplines that it used for the other fixed wing aircraft. A fatigue failure in the gyrodyne's rotor head caused the catastrophe and ended the gyrodyne program. However, the second incomplete gyrodyne was used towards another development program. The rotor system for the gyrodyne had been powered with the same engine that drove its forward thrusting propeller. Fairy Aviation had been investigating driving a rotor system through tip jets rather than through mechanical means. The decision was made to retrofit the gyrodyne as a testbed for this tip jet driven rotor system. We took the, the rotor and gearbox out of the original gyrodyne and replaced it with a two bladed tip 